The Dick Cabot Show. With Woody Allen, Joe Fraser, Julie Harris, John Hartford, Tom Baker, and Bob Rosengarten and the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cabot. Don't let me just stand here bathing in it. How are you? And, I, and hello to our friends shut in at home. I don't know who used to say that. Gee, that's impressive. You know, I just noticed backstage the voice of Fred Foy over the uh, thing. It sounds like at least Orson Welles is gonna walk out here instead of me. People have asked what Fred Foy looks like. If you've never seen him on my show, you can't right now because he's in a booth, unfortunately. That's where he does the announcing from. But he's um, uh, a rather handsome man. Uh, middle years, I would say. Um, very well-dressed, a uh, touch of gray at the temples. Uh, not bad looking for an old futz. He's uh, <laughs> quite a nice fellow, actually. Say, was it hot? It is hot here now. How, huh? How hot is it? No, that's the other guy. <laughs> I, uh, it was ter Yesterday, the, anyone who was here knows you could actually fry an egg on Broadway. It was that which is more sanitary than some of the places they fry eggs <laughs> on Broadway, but it was very... He's in there. Oh. Well, that encourages me to go on. My dumb cousin Norman, I have not mentioned in a long time, he's visiting me, and he showed up in a soaking wet shirt the other day, and I said, why is that? And he said, it says inside it, wash and wear. <laughs> but the egg on Broadway. We're about to get another one, aren't we? Anyway, say, Mr. Nixon was in town yesterday, or President Nixon, I guess you know about that, he, uh... Now that isn't nice, who did that? He, uh, went to the dentist, Does, you know this, it was in the paper. He had, I believe it was, uh, if I get this right, two fillings, uh, one cap, and Dr. Knowles removed. And, uh, <laughs> a, oh, and there's a movie. Please, I can't be bothered with applause. Um, the, I guess I can, yes I can. There's a movie called East of Krakatoa, I guess you know, uh, Java, uh, Krakatoa, East of Java. This is the point of the thing, the title um, was, has always been that, Krakatoa, East of Java, and they made all the publicity for it and all in the movies out. And someone, smart, checked a uh, map or whatever and they found out that Krakatoa is actually west of Java. This is no kidding, it was in the paper today. And it was too late to change all the expensive, uh, printing and the title and all. They were thinking of changing it to Krakatoa way, way, way east of Java. <laughs> but, uh, yes, they were. Hey, the Prince of Wales, how about him? <laughs> no, it's, it's not, actually, it's not the Prince of Wales yet, it's Prince Charles. And tomorrow, I believe the proper term is he is invested uh, as Prince of Wales. Can you imagine at his age, being Prince of Wales, being able to tell Richard Burton what to do? <laughs> I guess not, but let's go back to dentists for a second. Do you know, I, mean, I should have put this up with the other thing, but the dentists in New York, as you know, are striking against Medicaid patients. There's in today's paper, they will not take any new Medicaid patients. The thing is, they claim that the city has not provided for these people properly. The city is furious, and a city official responded typically yesterday that they had provided. In fact, the other day he signed an order for 1,200 doorknobs and 1,200 pieces of string. <laughs> if, if one person had laughed for every word in that, it would have been well. <laughs> And over the weekend, they had a lights on for decency. I'm trying everything on you, see. Uh, did, you know about this, this was for real too. Lights on for decency was this idea. If you were for decent literature and so on, you were supposed to put your car lights on over the weekend. But not a lot of people knew about it, so it didn't go over very big. <laughs> they did better at night. <laughs> you, know, but, you know, I saw a few people. I know, you're telling me to stop, but I was wondering, you, 
if you were for indecent literature, just as a, to pose a puzzle here, but going to a funeral that day, what would you do? <laughs> you see. Now, let me tell you about this. There is, <laughs> it's amazing. It's kind of roulette. I stand here, I miss, I went, hit one. Of them. But uh, there is a new show. I just want to mention this, and then we will move on because we have a lot of great guests here tonight. But there's a ge game show coming up that I want to watch for. It's called Guess the Stars. Have you read about this? Every week, Troy Donahue, Tab Hunter, and Tommy Sands get together and try to guess which is which. <laughs> We have today really a great guest. We have Woody Allen, Joe Fraser, heavyweight champion, and Julie Harris, John Hartford, and Tom Wicker from The Times. So stay with us and we'll be right back. My next guest is John Hartford. He uh, is a composer, as you know. He won the Grammy Award for Gentle On My Mind. And besides writing hit songs, John is a poet and an author, and he sings, as you know, and he probably does a number of things we don't even know about. <laughs> I don't know what I mean, so write in and let me know if you do. Uh, anyway, someone called him once a cross between Carl Sandburg and Flatt and Scruggs. I don't know who it was. It was not J. Edgar Hoover, but I don't know who it was. Will you, will you welcome John Hartford? Yes. Yeah. I never know to get up or not to shake hands with a... Does a man rise when another man to shake hands? I don't know. Have to consult us? He does? I wasn't asking you folks. <laughs> yeah, how you got in here? If I had my way about it, well, never mind. <laughs> I've seen you since Chicago. Yes, we, we captivated British? Chicago together. Yes. Uh, Without firing What a shot. were we there for? Oh, oh, I know, the, the Emmy thing. <laughs> I, I was there twice within yeah, succession. I right. forgot which one you were connected with. Yeah. Last time you were on the show, you had a novel idea about something, and I wonder if you have any new novel ideas. Uh, or ideas for new novels, <laughs> or uh, well, actually, anything. as a matter of fact, I've noticed that all of the uh, uh, that most singers now, when they make it, the first thing they do is go into the food business. They start a food chain. That's and right. So, you know, Eddie Arnold and Minnie mm -hmm. Pearl and all these people. So I've, I'm going to start a food chain for what I think is probably one of the most neglected and one of the most American of all foods, and that's the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> One thing, one, thing that really bug, one thing that really bugs me is to go into a restaurant in New York City, most of which they don't let me in anyway because I don't wear a coat and tie. Yeah. But uh, even then, after when I do get in and I order a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and they just, you know, they won't. They won't so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start a string. I'm going to start a string of peanut butter and jelly sandwich comfort stations. <laughs> For people who and have I'm one, I'm going to franchise and mm -hmm. I'm going to put one next to every restaurant in New York that won't serve me. Is it kind of mild protest, you know? What an idea. And we won't serve anybody who's wearing a coat and tie. Yeah. Is it uh, too late to invest in this idea? It sounds, uh, well, I, I don't know. Are you still writing uh, prose? I mean, the written word as opposed to the yeah. musical uh, yeah. phrase? Yeah. What are you working on? Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm working on a book, which I'm going to do. Really? A serious book? Of, yeah. Will a it be? Book of, uh, things that I've written. Will it be different from any previous book? Well, right now the tentative plan, I'm going to call it the round book because I want to, I want to write a book that has no beginning or end. So I'm going to... It'll actually it. be round? Yeah, it'll be on a stick. You go all the way around. <laughs> and you hold it up like this and you turn, you start anywhere you want and read it. <laughs> That's a, the, to keep pe people from Get, get them out of the, the, the old concept of always starting at the beginning and going on to the end and then stopping. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to dog ear a page, how do you know where to, to do it? Just fold it down. You can spin the stick Well, the pages around, stick so, out yeah, from right. the... Oh, right. I the see. The stick I, is like this, I, and then the pages all come out. Oh, I, I thought it was actually a round book, like a pie right. or all, something. Not only that, but it, it, uh, then it, you save a lot of money because you don't have to have a leather cover or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> I hate wearing a leather cover. Right. You wouldn't have to keep it in a bookshelf. You just like stick it in a hole right here. Yeah. You can keep it in a flower pot. That's true too. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful how I pick up on things and keep the keep the pace going? Uh, I'm going to bring Julie Harris out now because she, she has to leave for reasons um, known to everyone. Uh, Julie Harris is without a doubt one of the most 
gifted and honored actresses in America. Uh, she's now cavorting on Broadway in 40 carats, or cavorting on 40 carats. Plays on words are very popular these days, uh, but not here. <laughs> you probably remember that she made history in her portrayal of a 12-year-old when she was at least twice that age and member of a wedding, a member of the wedding, I mean. Will you welcome Julie Harris? <laughs> I'll sit in the guest of honors chair Thank for a while. Did. Somebody, who was it wrote about you that on stage you were a flame, but off stage you were a wisp of smoke? Do you remember that? I think I mean, it was John Van Druten. Right, yes. during I Am a Camera, probably. Yes. Like that. He also called me a glass of water. <laughs> but, he, he makes his but, metaphors. But I he? loved him for saying those things because he was really saying that I was like, um, like a wisp of smoke that you were hardly conscious of of me uh, being there, and suddenly I was given the ingredients of a part, and I became something else. Right. So it was a nice wisp of smoke, not the kind that makes yes, you strangle and cough. Yes, I thought so. And I love John, smoke. so yeah. anything he called me was fine with me. Yeah. Did, did, you, <laughs> did I miss something? <laughs> Do you actively avoid the uh, trappings of stardom? Well, when you say that, I think of... Um, great stars like uh, Sarah Bernhardt mm -hmm. and uh, oh, who else? Well, uh, well, any of the flamboyant film people. Anyway, uh, somebody uh, like Sarah Bernhardt mm -hmm. who uh, was known for her uh, uh, exploits, uh, say she, she was famous for having a coffin in the dressing room where she would retire to the coffin with long tapers on either side and hold a lily in her hand and compose herself before a play. Yeah, she really freaked well, out, didn't she? <laughs> <laughs> or she was always famous for having strange animals like baby elephants and cobras and pythons. I think mm -hmm. a python ate her favorite little dog and she was horrified to have the python killed. Or maybe it she... was an alligator, but she had lots of those. Well, I, I, I must say, <laughs> I'm a Little, I'm a little shy about going into that kind of menagerie. Yeah. When you were a kid dreaming of being an actress, uh, did, did any of the glamour appeal to you then and it doesn't now? Or yes, did it, 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 it never it, I, I forgot to say, really, that appeals to me. Oh, it does. But I haven't got the guts or the courage to carry it out. Uh -huh. I'd love to. Uh, I remember reading about Miss Bernhardt once. She went to a cafe with, and only her... Um, uh, she decided at the spur of the moment, uh, say it was a Sunday afternoon at home, and uh, she'd been resting all day, and she only had her uh, nightgown on, and she threw over it her um, opera-length uh, chinchilla coat and uh, went to a cafe. And there, I think, there was something. She met an, an actor who, uh, uh, who wanted to uh, take her out to dinner, but she really couldn't go because she was in her nightgown. <laughs> did, you, did you ever, how, wait, when did she die? How long ago? Uh, well, it must have been. Bernhardt? In the early Bernhard. 1900s. Yeah. Because she made several farewell All those tours. tours. Yes. Yeah. And I think it went in, I'd say about 1910, I'm not sure. You, don't, you I never think, saw her on the stage? Then. No, I never did. But I've heard a record, yeah. a recording of her voice. Yeah. Uh, did you ever get so into a role that you do take it home with you, the way they say Charles Lawton used to be tyrannical when he was playing a tyrant, uh, or nasty when he was playing a nasty part at home? Uh, does this happen? I know it's a cliche question, but I wonder if it happens to you. Well... I know I was playing um, uh, a chambermaid, a rather, a rather s sexy chambermaid in a play called A Shot in the Dark. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in my life, I liked uh, perfume. I bought myself perfume, which I had never done before. Yeah. So, and then, of course, when I was uh, in a play um, like The Lark, I was playing uh, Joan of Arc, I was... Uh, terribly conscious in my, own, in my own life of simplicity and uh, I didn't I didn't like a lot of, you know, I didn't pay much attention to clothes at that time 
<coughs> so it probably does affect you. So somewhere. it probably does. Yeah. Gee, could you do something for us? I know that this isn't a, a totally a surprise to you, but um, and you don't have to if you don't want to. But I know you do those. I've seen you do Emily Dickinson poems occasionally in public, and uh, you do them so beautifully. Well, would thank you, you Dick. Be would, able to do one? Would you like um, a happy one or a sad one? Because to me, she was. Hmm. She had, uh, she, uh, Emily was both things, you know. She, yeah. she had a happy spirit and she had also a tragic side to her nature. Um, I'd like to do one that I think is uh, one of her great poems. Uh, it's a little sad, but if that's all right. Hope it can follow the monologue. <laughs> <laughs> Would you do that one for us? Okay. I measure every grief I meet with analytic eyes. I wonder if it weighs like mine or has an easier size. I wonder if they bore it long or did it just begin? I could not tell the date of mine. It feels so old a pain. I wonder if it hurts to live and if they have to try and whether could they choose between. It would not be to die. I note that some, gone patient long, at length renew their smile, an imitation of a light that has so little oil. I wonder if when years have heaped some thousands on the harm that hurt them early, such a lapse could give them any balm, or would they go on aching still through centuries of nerve, enlightened to a larger pain in contrast to the love. The grieved are many, I am told. There is the various cause. Death is but one and comes but once and only nails the eyes. There's grief of want and grief of cold, a sort they call despair. There's banishment from native eyes in sight of native air. And though I may not guess the kind correctly, Yet to me, a piercing comfort it affords in passing Calvary to note the fashions of the cross and how they're mostly worn, still fascinated to presume that some are like my own. Miss Harris. Dick, please oh. call me Julie. <laughs> oh, I will, I will. Uh, I know that you have to go because uh, it's odd to be in a Broadway play that starts this late at night. It's after yes. 10 o'clock, but uh, thank you for coming by thank and I'll you, see Dick. you again. Thank so long. Woody Allen is a gentleman who, uh, you might call him one of the last of the great boulevardiers. He's detached and <laughs> droll and the, the essence of a man of the world. He, uh, he can be cruel when necessary, having to fight his way through the hordes of women who wait at the stage door. Uh, I don't know what mood he'll be in tonight, but will you welcome playwright, author, and bon vivant Woody Allen. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> this is the show. We're on. No, no, I know that. I, oh, I have oh, an oh, unbalanced I shoelace here. <laughs> the, uh... Bingo. That takes care of. Uh, or no, not the other one. No, no, no. I can... You can do that. If you come back, I do that again at 10 and 12. It's my that's thing. a sight of you I haven't seen. That takes care of my first question, which was, how are your shoes? <laughs> well, that's, that's, how do you, uh, 
How's it going? That's a dumb thing to ask, but I know you're playing nightly on Broadway, and it's really rough for you to even find time to get over here. Yes, it's going okay. I, I came back, uh, this was the first time I ever took a vacation at all for a weekend. I went to Fire Island for the weekend. <laughs> Why do they do that? I don't know. There's something about Fire Island that, that um, I don't know what it is. <laughs> I don't either. I, I, I know that uh, I went there once. I did not see anything unusually odd about Fire no. Island. I, didn't, I, I left there it the a... same way I found it. Yeah. You know? I went there on Saturday night, and this is my beach attire. I have yeah. sand in my sneakers and my pockets and in the little crevices of my body. <laughs> yes, I do. Little Perhaps we can get into that later. Uh, <laughs> I do know... What is this? You don't believe we can switch audiences and bring in another one, do you? No, I, I do know that. There, is, there are jokes about certain segments of Fire Island because there's one... Bless you. There, there is a... Uh, this guy sneezed on my arm. I, I didn't think they caught that at home. Does he? Germs are spread that way. Germs are our friends. That's another of your odd theories, yes. isn't it? You have several. Uh, they make us sick, particular. and then we don't have to show up to do our show every night. <laughs> yeah, you, know. Uh, you know what I was going to ask you once? I know that your show, anyone who knows who's seen it, uh, or who will see it, will know that it's just chock full of beautiful girls. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that was intentional or not, but uh, did you have a tough time finding that many pretty girls auditioning them? In, uh, it was... In no. Uh, it was yeah. tough to find girls that could act that were pretty. That was the problem. It was yeah. uh, beautiful women are a dime a dozen. This is the truth. Uh, you know, and for a guy like myself, <laughs> this is so. I, yeah. I, I knock them off like dominoes, you know, like that. <laughs> now, anyhow, when you go into the theater, they have like 20 or 30 waiting in the wings, and each one is more beautiful than the next. Mm -hmm. And they come out and they speak and they sound like Minnie Mouse or, you know, they're really bad. And <laughs> it's hard to find uh, uh, eight girls that can actually act. Yeah. But we you did. did. You managed to get a, a really a passel of lovelies, I yeah, must say. Yeah, really terrific. I mean, it just is a, it's a joy to go in there every night. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'll be playing the play till October, I think, or, you know, yeah. maybe beyond that, I don't know. And then you have your film coming out, which is uh, how soon in the future? Uh, I believe six weeks, I think. Six to eight weeks, and the movie should be out. Yeah. It, um... Why don't we... We have a clip from your film. Can we show that? Did you know that we did? Yes. Yeah, and we'll uh, show it. The name of the movie is... Uh, well, the name has of the movie? It's my turn? Yeah. Uh, is, uh, take, <laughs> take the money and run. Yeah. And uh, you want me to tell you... I, I, I think you should set up the clip a little bit, clip? because... Um, this is... I'm, I'm a, uh, a racketeer in the picture. <laughs> Not and uh, I, I uh, keep telling people that I'm with the Philharmonic um, mm. to throw them off so they don't, so they don't catch me. Sure. And um, in this section of the picture, um, I stick up a guy on a street corner. Uh, this is toward the end of the picture, but it's not the actual end of the picture. Great. With that in mind, we roll. Where, uh, where do I look? I believe we roll. Do we look at our Watch monitors? If you look right there. Last films of Virgil Stockwell being captured by the FBI. All right, get your hands up. This is a stick up. Hey, I know you. Virgil Stockwell. That's right. You, uh, oh, uh, uh, Eddie. Well, what, Haynes? That's right. That's. Oh. We were in the marching band together, right? You oh, played a cello. You were you always the, the, I was trombone, first trombone. Isn't that funny? <laughs> My God. Hey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm with the Philharmonic. No kidding, that's yeah. great. Oh. Gee, I was just talking to someone, uh, Oscar Sunken, oh, about the great times we used to have together. <laughs> they were hilarious. <laughs> you, you remember when we got caught taking a shower in the British locker room? I do. Oh. You, I never saw anybody so embarrassed. I, I, I'll never forget your face. <laughs> <laughs> My face? You dropped the towel. You dropped the towel, too? <laughs> <laughs> Let me have your uh, watch, will you? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, hey, hey, remember uh, that we, we painted the, the car uh, yellow? Right, the I remember that, that. That's right, it was Halloween. Oh, that was really <laughs> funny. It was yellow stripe. That's, that's right, like a barber pole. <laughs> <laughs> hey, keep your hands up. I have to shoot you. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, Jesus. Did you remember the football game? That you fumbled the right, last so, play. Oh, yeah, you picked right. up the ball. That's that right. And then I ran the wrong way. Oh, oh, and everybody was yelling, go back up. And I thought they were cheering. Right, right. You can't beat the good old days. <laughs> or the good old nights. Show me, Sid Fritz. You remember? Oh, sure. Wallet. Okay, thank you. I didn't hear you. Thank you. Uh, 
But look, it's been great speaking to you, really. Oh, it's so nice to see you, Virgil. Yeah, you too. Take it easy. Yeah. Best of you again. Yeah, best of luck to you. Okay. Uh, Virgil, uh, I just realized yeah. that I'm a cop. No kidding. How's yeah. it going? Oh, it's a great job. Yeah? I get a, I get a pension. Do you remember what you That's I think they love it. Well, that's one little section of the picture, and um, the fellow yes. with me was Mark Gordon, who is, uh, we shot this, uh, we shot that section of the picture in New York, mm -hmm. and um, it's toward the end of the picture. I can't tell you the end, because... No, don't breathe a word of the end. No surprise to it at all. Oh. <laughs> no one will be seated during the picture, or after it started, before it started, or, or at the end. What rating does the picture have, then? Uh, the picture, it's P, perverts only. Oh. <laughs> I guess I, uh, <laughs> I guess I should have known. Uh, we have to pause and we'll be back. Yes. I'll tell you what. Let me reword that. Now a word from a bowl cleaner with a more active cleaning ingredient than the other leading brands, Santa Flash. Yes, sir. Uh, before you came here tonight, some of the people in the audience were uh, anxious to meet you, and we couldn't uh, have everyone meet you, of course. So they wrote questions to you, and we grabbed up a handful of them. And uh, <laughs> Do you mind if uh, we just have a go at these and see what happens? No, no, I don't mind anything. I'm, okay. I'm game. This is to Mr. Allen. Are these, these people signed them? Oh, yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like blondes or brunettes, thin or just pleasingly? That's from Joe Brenda. Is that two people, Joe Brenda? Uh, no, I think Joe Brenda is one person, unless uh, he or she or both of them disagree. Z <laughs> I like blondes and the very... fatter the better. You know? <laughs> yeah. I like really fat chicks. That's, you know, it's I don't a, it's think a, you've ever revealed that. This is the truth. It's a weirdness of mine, but I mm -hmm. like a really gigantic <laughs> women, you know, four or five hundred pounds with jowls and fat. Thighs. I, I love fat thighs. I, I love to brush my cheek up against a really bulbous thigh. <laughs> well, if we'd, if we'd known, perhaps we could have arranged something. Uh, this woman says, did you ever meet a real woman? I mean, the R is kind of underlined. That's what I was trying to figure out there. But I believe you've dealt with uh, the kind you would like to meet. A real woman. A real, what, what is it? It depends on the definition of a real woman. Yeah, it's not? hard to know what they mean by that. Yeah, a real woman, they, you always get the impression that it's someone, you know, who sits around on silks and satins and breathes fire and everything. <laughs> and that I, um, I, I stay away from real women as often as possible, you know? Uh, it's true, because you don't want... Okay. Um, they're, um, they're too formidable. You know what I mean? The idea is to get, try and get losers. You know, there are certain. Uh, this is a good for, If you hit on ugly chicks mm -hmm. as you go through life, you'd be amazed what a great percentage of scores you make. I think. Uh, really? That's funny. Didn't didn't Dr. Rose Franz Blau say much the same thing? <laughs> you know, well, I may be wrong. Uh, let me see. What outstanding talents do you have, and what are some of your hobbies? I uh, hope that doesn't overlap. Um, yes, I, I collect open sores. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is true. How, how many of you thought he wouldn't treat these seriously? <laughs> and I, I like to fill cavities. A little bit of amateur dentistry on the side. Yes, yeah. and mm -hmm. I, li I like to be hickeyed by midgets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe we've uh, put something in for everybody there. Uh, Let's see, uh, how did you like, oh, this is odd. How did you like the tuna fish in the Midwood High School cafeteria? Is, that, <laughs> is there anybody out here from Midwood? Is that a real place? Yeah, Midwood High School, sure. Oh, that's your actual... Uh, yes, it's a... It's yeah. a uh, is there someone here from, uh, yeah. from Midwood? Yeah. Oh, oh that's oh. right. This girl right down here. Oh, is Midwood uh, bisexual? What is the phrase I want? <laughs> uh, <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> sneeze again, John, we need it. <laughs> What was the word I wanted? Co-educational. Co yes, right. I often say bisexual when <laughs> okay. I mean something else. I don't know. <laughs> Let, let's, uh, let's move on before we get... Why do you always scratch your head, Sharon Weinstein? Well, there's Sharon up there, right? Uh, laughing with many voices. Really? Hmm. I'm, I'm trying to 
to stimulate my dandruff, if, if there's any <laughs> possibility. I'm trying to accumulate the world's largest collection of dandruff, if I possibly can. When you get it, can we be the first to show it? Yes, it's multicolored flakes. Okay. And <laughs> I accumulate them in neat little piles around the house. And I have people over, and I use them as conversation pieces. <laughs> That's, I, I, somehow I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Would you like to meet, we have a surprise for you because I know what an inveterate fight fan you are. You're practically oh, yes. always ringside. Uh, I was the other night. Even when the garden is closed. What he goes, all, I think to almost all of the major uh, fights. The other night we did our show, uh, play it against Sam and, we, and we, we cut the first intermission down by about five minutes and we mm. cut out the second intermission completely, which was really work, and we just ran as fast as we could and we got uh, to the garden in time to see the championship fight. The Fraser fight. The Fraser Quarry fight, yeah. I don't know if he says Fraser or Frazier. I say Fraser. If there's any but, problem, uh, I'll take care of it. Would you handle it? <laughs> Listen, I, I plan to tell him exactly what I think of him when he gets out here, which is that he's honorable and courageous and all of those things. Uh, I, have I have to never... move over, right? You may whether you want to or not. Yeah, okay. yes. I've never met a heavyweight champion that I... Well, of course, uh, Cassius Clay. Wh but, I mean, right after he had fought like this, it's quite a, quite a thrill for me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know a great deal about heavyweight boxing. My interest in it spans the Billy Kahn joe Lewis fight up to the marriage of Ethel Merman and Ernest Borgnine. That's about that. <laughs> <laughs> Will you... Uh, <laughs> there seem to be several heavyweight champions these days. Will you welcome one of them, Joe Frazier? <laughs> Fraser, Fraser, which? How do you say it? Uh, Fraser. Fraser. Right. There are a lot of states that in which you are not heavyweight champion. I know this is an old, tiresome subject, but um, what what is this? I can't keep up with the fact that in some states they don't recognize the champion that other people recognize. Well, it really bothered me also. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know much about it. The only thing I usually do is keep up with the fight game. You know what I mean? Like uh, stay in condition. I let the manager and the trainer worry about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, in your mind, uh, what, what rank does Muhammad Ali have now? Well, I have, uh, I think he's uh, one of the uh, good fighters besides myself, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> I don't really uh, get into it because uh, I try to stay away from uncle as much as possible because uh, politics really is not my business, you know, and right. uh, I think... Uh, this is politics, so I stay away from him. But I really think he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. The other day he said he'd put you into orbit. <laughs> well, I heard really? that before, Dick. Uh, many guys have tried, but they have failed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think, uh, I don't know if it was today or yesterday, I, uh, someone said that if you did fight him, that the odds would probably be uh, in your favor at the moment. Um, I guess there's no possibility of your fighting him, is there? Well, he does look bad uh, yeah. for me and him to meet each other because right now he does have a problem. It's a great problem. Mm -hmm. But I think if he should come back, I'll be able to take him. Mm -hmm. There's no kind of problem. Yeah. Will Jimmy Ellis fight you? <laughs> what yeah. have I said? <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I offered Jimmy uh, to fight me before I met uh, Quarry, mm -hmm. but he turned it down. I think he turned down a half a million dollars uh, because he didn't want to face me. So now I would love to fight him, but I feel like this. Why should I give him a shot at it, uh, give him a shot to make money? Because he had his chance and he turned it down. Yeah. So I give somebody else a chance. Who else? Well, you look like a real great fella. <laughs> I, I do fight, though. That's what you do tonight. fight. I saw you fight, um, uh, uh, um, who was it, on The Tonight Show one night? You, you fought... Yeah, uh, sure. I fought the best. I, yeah. um, Rocky Graziano. I did fight Rocky, yeah. yeah. I, I tend to lose consciousness quickly, though. Yeah, that's my problem. I, I, I got I, a, a knuckle in the tooth coming in with Rocky. I could say nothing but the word babo for four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. We will, be, uh, we will be back. Yes, we will.
Uh, it is said that in Washington, D.C., or official Washington, as it's sometimes called, nobody reads the Times without turning to Tom Wicker's column. Uh, I know that he, uh, you may know that he wrote a book, a very interesting book about the, uh, what he considered the fatal problems of uh, LBJ and JFK and those that, in a sense, ruined their administrations for them. Um, the book was uh, written, I believe, uh, I know it was written before he knew that Mr. Johnson was going to abdicate, but I'd like to ask him about that. Will you welcome now one of America's most astute and stylish journalists, Tom Wicker from the Times. Thank you. I just got to read your book over the weekend, and uh, it's particularly interesting now because of the fact that you to synopsize it, you have LBJ and JFK having these crises at the very beginnings of their administrations, uh, two sort of fatal missteps for their effectiveness as presidents and all. And uh, could you fill us in on what they were for those who may not have read the book? Well, uh, particularly in the case of President Johnson, um, I wrote, and I think it's true, that right at the outset of his, his, of his administration, within 48 hours after the assass assassination of uh, President Kennedy, mm -hmm. uh, President Johnson had to make the basic political decision that ultimately led him on, step by step, into the Vietnam controversy. He had to make a decision as to what attitude he would take towards Vietnam. case of President Kennedy, a little bit less uh, cosmic than that, I think, but uh, at least in the version of events that I presented, uh, I felt that when he came into office right away and faced a couple of very difficult legislative battles in Congress, that it became apparent very quickly that he um, had nothing particularly new in a domestic sense to offer to the American people and had no particular magic in order to get through even the old bills that he was coming along. And so that the great prestige and the great moment that he had created, that people expected so much from him, disappeared very quickly. Yeah, it's kind of shocking to run across the phrase a failing president about him, but you mentioned in the book that as, he, as John F. Kennedy died, he was considered by many a failing, if not failed, president, having failed president. Um, and it's interesting at this point because, uh, of course, we're early in Mr. Nixon's administration, and this idea must haunt him. I don't know if he's read your book, but the possibility that there <laughs> is do. some <laughs> blunder or re events you don't recognize right earlier in an administration that could just doom it from the almost the beginning. Well, I don't know whether he's made that kind of a, a blunder in the approximately six months that he's been in office or not, but um, I do think that he has made a, a basic miscalculation already that it seems to me could, could be very difficult, not only for him, but for all of us as time comes along, which is I, the evidence to me is that, that his, the president and his administration, that they uh, badly underestimate the, the uh, severity and the depth of the domestic crisis in this country, the uh, problems we have in our cities, problems we have with the environment, with race, uh, with still with, with poverty. Uh, above all, in many ways, or one that concerns me now, the, the difficulties developing between our older and our younger generations. I think the Nixon, admi Nixon administration in many ways just simply doesn't recognize uh, the depth and degree of this crisis and its attention is focused elsewhere in Romania, places of that kind. Yeah. Can I ask a question here? Yeah. I just want to go back to one thing about the, the phrase failing president with Kennedy. Isn't it uh, so, though, that, that there was something that um, Kennedy represented and gave to the country just by, uh, by virtue of his being president that's not easily measured in terms of, you know, legislation or, or you know, there was, there was another contribution that Kennedy made that, that uh, is, has not been made by Nixon and Johnson and, and um, you know, because of a certain um, lackluster quality that they have and a certain um, a charismatic quality that he had that can't easily be measured in... Uh... I think that's right. It's, it's getting a little difficult now at the passage of time to make a clean, sharp distinction between the contributions of the kind that you mentioned of President Kennedy and the late, the late Senator Kennedy. But I think taking the two together in particular, and certainly with the lead having been set by President Kennedy, they did create a certain, uh, in, in a sense, 
uh, the Kennedy administration in particular gave back to the public service a certain respectability that it hadn't had before. It gave, gave, uh, it gave people a sense that they wanted to go into the government, that they wanted to tackle the problems that government must deal with, that they wanted to do something about cities and about young people and about poor people and so forth. And uh, many of the leading minds in our country uh, uh, were mobilized in that way. And, I, and um, I think then Senator Kennedy came along and, and built on what his brother had done and, uh, and gave us a real sense of, uh, of dedication, a sense of mission, made, uh, made idealism respectable again, in a sense. Uh, so in, in that way, I certainly quite agree that uh, the Kennedy brothers made a, an enormous contribution, one that have a lasting impact on me and on many others. Uh, and I think that phrase that you used, I'm not sure that I precisely used that or not, it had to do with the political situation at the time of President Kennedy's death. It appeared to many people then, I know, that he was in deep political trouble uh, because of the failure of many uh, practical propositions that he had put forward. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by an idea of yours, and William F. Buckley was here the other day and I was talking to him about it. Uh, this idea that there is a third group in, um, in Vietnam. This was your editorial uh, called uh, Backing the Wrong Horse. Uh, there are the communists and there's the two regime, but there is a third group that loathes the communist to possible takeover of Vietnam but loathes the two regime also. And because we're backing this repressive militaristic regime, as you characterized it, we are losing a potential ally there that could uh, gain the end that we supposedly were trying to gain by fighting this war. Uh, have I botched it? No. Uh, <laughs> no more than I might have in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think that that uh, third force uh, uh, sentiment exists there, uh, unquestionably. A great many people who oppose, or at the very least are very lukewarm about the Tew administration in uh, South Vietnam are not communists. Uh, they have no use for the communists in, in, in political terms. They, they don't want a coalition government, for example. Uh, uh, they, it's, there's a, a great force here, and the leaders of that, leaders among those people are convinced that they will never be able to rally the great majority of the South Vietnamese people to the support of the Tew government for the reason, for two primary reasons. The first of which is that, in their view, and I think the facts tend to substantiate this, it's a repressive government that throws people into, into jail for uh, political reasons and doesn't even come close to being uh, an, an, a democratic government in terms of, of social justice for the people. Not, not necessarily in terms of its processes, that's not the point, but in terms of social justice for the people. And the second fact is because that government is backed, by, is backed uh, to the hilt and on every point by the American government. Hence, the government tends to be, the two government tends to be the puppet of a foreign government. And the NLF, whatever else it may be, is not presented in those terms because they're native, uh, they're native uh, South Vietnamese. Now, there are many people who recognize that the NLF is, is uh, to be called a puppet of Hanoi or, or Russia or wherever. There are many people who are nationalists in South Vietnam and who don't want to be a puppet of anybody. And those are the people that we are failing to reach through the two government. Very important political force, I think. Mm -hmm. What do you think could happen if the, if the Nixon administration were to realize and agree that the, we are, the two regime is undesirable um, to the point where they have to try to get uh, rid of it? What, what can they do? Well, uh, it's very much easier, of course, to get into a war of this kind and into a situation of this kind than it is to get out, particularly if you want to get out on terms that Mr. Johnson and now Mr. Nixon have, have, uh, have placed, basically terms they want to get out uh, in such a manner as to appear to have won. Uh, that's what it means when you say you want an honorable settlement. The fact of the matter is they haven't won, and so it's very difficult for them, for them to proceed that way. But what I think, if the, if the Nixon administration really just, just decided it was going so to speak, to cut its losses mm -hmm. and uh, cut our losses and move out of there, uh, then I think the first procedure would be to put the two government on notice uh, that we were going to do so and that we were going to do so with, uh, with a high degree of rapidity. Uh, it presents a great difficulty not just simply to give yourself totally away in, in the bargaining in Paris, and there are many elements that we theoretically represent, do represent, in the Paris negotiations that are well worth representing. So you don't want to just throw the position away, but I think if we made very strong private representations to the two government uh, that we were getting ready to go unless certain things were done, then A, the throwing of political prisoners into jail and brutal jails at that might be stopped, and B, 
uh, there might be a broadening of the two government in terms of the members of its cabinet so that it would be more representative, so that, for instance, it would represent uh, the uh, Buddhist church, so that it would represent some of the national elements that I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. We must uh, pause for a moment, uh, and here's a word about keeping those uh, pesky mosquitoes off, right here. Mr. Wicker, in the Times this morning, there was a picture of uh, the Chiefs of Staff and an article about the fact that the uh, power of the Pentagon, which a lot of people consider already dangerously pervasive, is likely to get much more so. Um, how do you feel about that, and how ominous is that, if it's true? Well, I don't think it's all that ominous, uh, and if I can correct you a little bit, I don't think that's quite what the article said. The article said that the influence of the Joint Chiefs of Staff within the Pentagon is right. increasing. Because now, of Mr. Laird's... Uh, that's right. And, and uh, I'm not so sure that, uh, to be perfectly frank, that that's a terrible thing. It's, uh, it's not the way one would choose to have it arranged, but you have to remember that under the present, under the former uh, system of management in the Pentagon, in which uh, the uh, Foreign Policy Department, the International Security Agency, and uh, the uh, Systems Analysis Agency had great power, and we got into the Vietnam War, and then after that we got into it a good deal deeper. So. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure that this is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and besides that, the total power of, of the military attitude in America, it seems to me, quite aside from whether a man wears a uniform or, or, or not. Uh, some people speak of the military-industrial complex. I'm more impressed by the military-congressional complex myself. But uh, the total power of the, of the military approach to the world, it seems to me, has lessened since the Nixon administration came in, not, not increased, and that has nothing to do with the way he organized the Pentagon or who he is or what he plans to do, but simply because, for a variety of reasons, somehow the American people are much more nearly awake to the dangers of this and to some of the contradictions of it, to some of the absurdities of it, uh, and so that I think that the military probably has, the military attitude probably has less a free hand in the United States today than it has had in the 10 years that I've been in Washington. Mm -hmm. This trip to Romania that, that Mr. Nixon's going to make now, how was that going to affect our lives? What do you think the significance of that is? Is there one that we don't know about? No, I don't think so. The, the major significance of that trip will be in Asia, where he is going to meet with the uh, nations that are loosely at least allied with us in the Vietnam effort. Mm -hmm. That, I think, could have some significant impact because uh, uh, it is true that, that uh, some effort will have to be made by these nations in the future uh, to provide a, f a fairly independent stance for themselves in Asia. If, on the other hand, the Nixon administration encourages uh, the sort of embryonic regionalism of Asia to become, to have a military expression, to become a sort of a regional pact against communism, and I think that's a formula for trouble in another war. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Jim, sir, we're cut off by time, and there are a lot of other things I wanted to ask you, but maybe you can come back and uh, I hope so again. Uh, to, thank you, Woody Allen, Joe Fraser, Julie Harris, John Hartford, and Tom Wicker. That you all know who you are. And tomorrow's guests are Clifford Alexander, Edwin Starr, Brother Theodore, and Gina Lola Brigadeur. Is that possible? Yes. We'll be here tomorrow. Thank you. This is Fred Foy speaking. Good night. <laughs>